it's time for any news cut content for episode 23 elsa's deadly fight and emilia's future novel i want to know more about the emilia future one but let's get it with so many climactic moments happening all at the same time what comes with it is a lot of content that needs to be talked about there's the missing parts of elsa's fight with garfield a whole perspective to the battle with the guilty route that we weren't even given a deeper explanation to the numerous visions from Amelia's trial. And That's finally what I know. an encounter with a witch that alludes to something more. Mother. Mom. All of which we'll cover as we go through what the anime didn't include from the novel. Let's begin. Episode 48. Love you down to your blood and guts. Covering chapter 3 to chapter 6 of volume 15 of the light novel. As we jump straight into the con- Is it just me or the quality shit it is? Why is it automatically 360p bro? What the hell's happening? continued fight between Elsa and Garfield. We find Garfield to be getting pushed back by Elsa's superior skill, mainly because no two of the same attacker technique would ever work on her. That's right. She literally said, oh, I've seen that before, adapted. She downloads you like a fucking professional fighting game player. After she had witnessed something only once, Elsa was sure to counter it the next time with a very precise shift in movement. Mahoraga. Adaptable. OP. Allowing her to follow it up with a very damaging punish afterward. While this did initially put Garfield at a very significant disadvantage, he was eventually able to come up with a plan that would counter her counter. And that was the initial strike that we saw in the anime. The eye gouge. What Garfield did was he basically led his charge with an attack that Elsa had already seen before. This was in hopes of getting her to counter with an attack of her own. And then we counter that. He wanted Elsa to open herself up by forcing her to go on the offensive. Basically, you bait with an attack she knows, and now you're reading ahead. I'm going to do rock, and she's going to counter with paper, but I know that's going to happen, and the scissors will come right after. It's like, there's this thing called Yomi levels in fighting game, and I think that's only been mentioned by Scar in like Super Smash Bros. Melee. Anyways, these levels are like, level 1 is like, I'm going to do rock and you're going to do paper, alright? That's like level 1 counter. Level 2 is... I'm going to do rock knowing you're going to do paper, but I'll switch it up with the scissors. Right, there's like layers to this, man. Sure enough, Elsa followed through with a counter just like he'd expected. She struck his leg with a slash of her knife that carved straight through his right foot all the way to his femur. Ooh. Had Garfield positioned himself any lower, then Elsa would have been able to cut his leg off right there. But because this was something he was expecting, he was able to minimize the damage and follow through with his own devastating attack. A counter that was only possible due to his absolute trust in his opponent's ability. What I mean is that, because he fully believed in Elsa's flawless technique and intuition, he was able to land what should have been a fatal blow. That was nasty. As we saw though, that turned out to be nothing more than a minor inconvenience. Vampire! Switching over to Subaru. The fight between him and the Guilty Rao was actually given from both their perspectives. It was a much more interesting portrayal of this demon beast than what we saw in the anime. Right. This hippo is so creepy because it smiles with these human teeth. That's the scariest thing. Other than making him look like nothing more- The white whale too. It had a creepy ass smile. More than a wild animal. The guilty Rao was instead made out to be as this fairly intelligent creature. One whose very reason for living was for the thrill of the hunt. That's right, it's an assassin. So a lot of the stuff we don't see in the anime is how this black king of the forest perceived its prey. In the beginning, what mattered most to the king was that its prey be worthy of hunting. To be able to kill a strong opponent with his own fangs was all this demon beast could have ever hoped for. So prideful. But everything that went to make the hunt so enjoyable for him was now being tainted by the helpless prey he was after. To him, they were far too weak and thoughtless to even consider them such. <laughs> even so, this apex predator wasn't about to defy the orders of its master. Because she had saved him from the curse of its horn, the what? guilty Rao knew that it owed Melee a significant debt. Curse of so its horn. It had no intentions of letting any of her targets go. What do you mean the curse of her horn? I know that if you break a witch fiend's horn, then you can control them, but the guilty low seems to have the horns, implying that like Melee is able to just like overpower these witch fiends without having to break them like the bald shaman dog. I don't know, what is these horns? Rao knew that it owed Melee a significant debt. So it had no intentions of letting any of her targets go. He was just disappointed that they were a lot weaker than he was expecting. Hmm. As the guilty Rao tracked the sound of their footsteps no, the bat. The he moved with a level of agility that showed why he was worthy of the name Shadow Lion. Then, as soon as he believed he had finally caught up, he turned the corner and swung his claws in an attack that he knew was sure to hit. But, rather than there being a bloodied corpse like how he thought there to be, what he found instead was absolutely nothing. 
the presence he was tracking had completely vanished. It was now coming from a completely different direction. Seeing as how he'd just been played, the king felt that maybe his prey wasn't as weak as he initially thought they were. That's crazy. There's this much detail from the perspective of this monster in the novels. Because, and a kid that also mentioned the time found how intelligent and what of an assassin monster this is. It did seem pretty stupid in the anime. Perhaps they were fools actually worthy of dying to his fangs. So once again, the guilty route commenced his pursuit. When he finally caught up to the footsteps for a second time, the standing before him was actually one of the targets he'd been chasing. But it was right as he found him that he also heard his master calling for him. Maybe. As much as he felt- <laughs> Look at that dog, bro. Look at that dog. It looks so evil in the smile. Felt compelled to follow her orders and leave. He also didn't want to let the prey standing in front of him get away either. So the guilty route decided that it would dispatch the target quickly, then go back to melee after. It was then that the human ran into a room that looked to be like a dead end, leading the king to believe that it was preparing itself for one final duel. But that hope for an honorable challenge was quickly dashed when the target just ran straight into a smaller room, bringing us to the scenes that we saw in the anime. In the end, the Guilty Rao's final thoughts were of what was going to happen to its forest. I mean, it was after all the king. So having been defeated by some unknown enemy that he couldn't even see, the king couldn't help but wonder what was going to happen to his vacant throne. Aww. I, I didn't really think about that. The king is, well... It's not like he cares about the people of the forest more like, oh no, I'm number one in the forest, now I'm gone, who's gonna be the next number one? But yeah, Otto and Petra, raining oil down on its back, out of nowhere, it got assassinated. The assassin monster got assassinated. Now, if you're wondering how exactly Subaru and the others were able to deceive their enemy, well, that's because Otto had used his magic to create fake footsteps and eliminate their scent. You can do that? It was pretty much the same thing he did when he was trying to get the upper hand on Garfield. Okay. But anyway. Because the Guilty Rao was the only beast immune to the effects of the Repel Stone, Subaru was able to easily take Petra and Otto to the study on the upper floor. He then directed them to a hidden passageway behind one of the bookshelves, an underground path that led straight to the outside and exited far beyond the perimeter of demon beasts. So this was where Subaru had split up with the other two, and while it is where we would switch over to Amelia, rather than go back and forth between Sanctuary and the mansion, We'll instead talk about the rest of Elsa and Garfield's fight now, then okay. take a look at Amelia's trial after. I'm down. The initial parts to this epic battle were pretty much as we saw. But right as the two charged at each other and were about to collide, that's when Melee's rock pig had crashed into the building. Garfield was shocked to see such a beast appear as if out of nowhere. But what shocked him more was the fact that it was being ordered around by such a little girl. Yeah, that little girl's so strong. It was strong. obvious that this was the beast master Subaru had been referring to. When Frederica brought him up to speed with the situation, the reason he got so mad was because of the number of injuries he could see on her. Her ragged breathing and pale face from all the blood she'd lost was more than enough to indicate she'd been taking on numerous other demon beasts along with this massive one. Oh, little bro cares a lot for big, you know, big sister, Aneki. So as his composure began to shift from focus to anger, Frederica had to remind him that she too was skilled enough in combat. Sure, she may not have trained every day like how he had, but she was still a maid of the Mathers family. A statement that forced Garfield to remember just how strong one of the Mathers maids could be. Okay, but Ram is different though. Ram, Ram is like born different. So while it did convince him that Frederica was fine holding her own, it didn't change the fact that he was still very angry. As for Elsa and Melee, well, there was- That's a crazy Elsa shot. Right now it looks like she's not even wearing anything. It's an interesting bit of context given here- Still. Regarding the fate of the Guilty Rao. You see, Elsa immediately noticed that the number of demon beasts remaining were low. While part of the reason for this was Frederica's involvement and the presence of a fire, another factor affecting their decreasing numbers was the lack of the king. Yes, Melee was the beast tamer, but the Shadow Lion was a significant help in keeping many of the other demon beasts in line as well, even if he was a hassle to keep under control. The benefits of bringing him with her far outweighed the negatives. Well, at least that was if he stayed alive. Since the Guilty Rao was now dead though, managing the remaining demon beasts had now become a lot more difficult. I didn't know there was uh, that much implications on like how the Guilty Lil was like helping manage the beasts. I thought they would just listen unconditionally to Mady, but... Petra and Otto has slain a witch fiend that is only surpassed by the three great witch fiends, the whale, rabbit, and snake. That, that's kind of crazy if you think about it. Since the Guilty Rao was now dead though, managing the remaining demon beasts had now become a lot more difficult. In any case, 
with the two pairs of siblings now facing off against each other. Meili was becoming a bit concerned with Elsa's focus on someone who wasn't even a target. The fact that she was pretty much abandoning her job had made Meili warn her about the scolding that was sure to come from a person she called Mama. Mama? Wait? There's no way Meili would, you know, refer to Roswell as Mama as he is the employer, but there's someone else. There's a woman figure named Mama that Elsa and Meili kind of like takes orders from. Maybe it's part of their whole assassination guild? I don't know. We don't exactly know who this person is, but huh. it's most likely that she's the one who's in charge of the assassin organization. Okay. Regardless of what her punishment was going to be though, Elsa was committed to completing her showdown against Garfield. And so too was Garfield committed to doing the same, both unwilling to allow anyone else to interfere. Now, one of the aspects that didn't make it into the fight was a creative tactic used by Elsa to try and catch Garfield by surprise. She had charged in for an attack all while purposely leaving herself open, giving Garfield no choice but to take advantage of the opportunity she was presenting him with. The bait! So, as he countered with a strike that removed Elsa's entire left arm from her torso, the blade she was holding in that hand had mysteriously vanished. To the other Only arm. after hearing the high screeching sounds of it bouncing off the walls, did Garfield realize that it was being deflected straight towards the back of his head. Since Elsa was about to recover- Elsa literally threw it like a ricochet blade? ...and attack him one more time. He wasn't able to just turn around and deal with it. So, once again, Garfield had been caught between a pincer attack of blades from both sides. Luckily for him, a corpse of a demon beast was right next to his feet, giving him something to kick up into the air between oh, okay, himself okay. and the blade flying right at him. Nice While awareness. While it didn't reduce the force of the impact, it did prevent the blade from piercing his skull. But the heavy hit that came with it had spun him around in a way that opened himself up to a fatal attack. It left him with no choice but to use his blessing of the earth spirit to project himself right into the air. That shit's OP. With Elsa still in the motion of charging at where he was, Garfield was able to grab her face while in the air then use partial transformation to rip most of it to shreds. That attack was so nasty. Elsa's entire like left skull was like shattered. That's crazy though. Partial transformation. Some like One Piece Gear 3 shit right there. Bop. Most of it to shreds. His claws had reached so far Ooh. into her skull that even her regenerative ability wasn't enough to save her from the pain of it. So it was only natural that Elsa began- Okay, this scene was nasty. Nasty in a good way. There was something so sexual about this scene as they were both biting on each other and then the leg movement. And to scream as her body and face were being ripped to literal pieces. But even that wasn't enough to diminish her spirit. Now, after the rock pig had charged in to join the fight, the way it met its death was a little bit different in the novels. Garfield didn't exactly use some weird wrestling move to rip its head off. That was crazy. Garfield literally overpowered this rock piggy by like jumping up and then doing like a corkscrew driver. like. Mid-air, he twists the head off. Some weird wrestling move to rip its head off. Instead, he took advantage of the pig's weak spot. Okay. What the, the anime didn't quite show was that Garfield had been trying to use his claws to rip into the hide of the rock pig's exterior. But with every swing he made, his claws would just end up breaking and he himself would get pushed further backwards. Eventually resulting in Garfield getting pushed straight onto his back. Okay. Since the rock pig was trying to end this as fast as possible. It raised its front legs in an attempt to stomp Garfield's face in, but it was as it did that Garfield used the exposure of its weak spot to deliver the decisive blow. The belly blow? He projected himself straight into the pig's underbelly so he could claw and gnaw at it, a move that gave him ample time to completely gut his opponent from the stomach. Okay. Now, for a bit- That- I get the logic, like underbelly is the weak point, but like, it just wouldn't be as cool, right? What would be a cooler way to pop off during this hype scene? Garfield just like noticing the weak point in the belly and then slicing it? I just feel like whatever camera work could be done, it, it wouldn't look as cool. This is like an anime only scene where they highlighted Garfield doing some crazy wrestling shit like jump upwards, he's upside down, tornado 360 head fucking twist off. That shit was amazing. So I'm glad the studio did something or anime original just to kind of give us some more fan service. Now, for a bit more context behind the information Garfield had read about vampires, the books he'd received were actually from an unknown source outside of Sanctuary. He didn't know who it was that was sending them, but he made sure to read anything that he could. Books. Better to use <laughs> than delivering books? No, he's not, not, not at this current time of the age, but Garfield did make a lot of comments about how he loves reading books. He wouldn't expect it. 
you wouldn't expect Garfield to love books because he's a unga boonga brain, but he reads a lot. He even read the book marrying off of that, like, uh, Reed Austria, the first sword saint, right? And he learned how to do martial arts like him. Mainly so he could learn to take care of whatever problem was troubling the woman he'd fallen for. <clears throat> so, as it turns out, one of those books just so happened to cover the topic of vampires. And it was from that book that he was able to learn that they weren't in fact immortal. Yes, they did have very impressive regenerative abilities, but even that was Next. supposed to have its limits. So there is like a final threshold. So I didn't completely understand or could not confirm that Elsa was dead because like even if you crush her with the hippo, you just, you know, Reinhard attack Elsa tanked it. So why couldn't she tank the hippo attack? But there's something thematic about like the backstory being mentioned, her Nate being bit, and then the hippo crushing as Elsa like it looks like Elsa gave up at the end. Like, she's like, huh, you know what? Maybe this is my time to go, and she just accepted her death. Since he had already delivered a fatal attack four times before, yeah. Garfield knew that it would only take one or two more times to finish off Elsa for good. Maybe it was truly, like, her last livestock left. It didn't matter how much she tried to hide it, because the fact remained that she was approaching the limit to the amount of time she could restore herself. As the two continued to exchange attacks once again, Elsa decided the best time to share the story. And that point, right? Garfield's shield no longer exists. The right one anyways. This shit got snapped? Right? No. Blades... No, 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 no. Wasn't there a moment? I swear there was a moment where we saw one of his shields get snapped up. Maybe I just saw it wrong and mistook the Elsa's blades getting shattered for Garfield's shield. Decided the best time to share the story of her past was right in the middle of this. Unlike what we saw in the anime. Strike after strike carried with it the words of her past as- It is destroyed later though, right? Yeah. If they were part of a song. There was no reason for Garfield to have heard these words during the intense fight that was happening, but somehow his mind couldn't help but perceive every single one of them. So, rather than it just being the two of them standing across from each other with Elsa sharing her story, it was instead during the very dance of their battle that she spoke without even missing a beat. Okay, and during that time, did Garfield also say, Shut up, hag, I don't care? Given that neither could land a proper hit on the other, Elsa's story simply continued without so much as a single pause. It was only after she managed to strike Garfield's head with a kick strong enough to send him flying into the wall that she finally took a brief moment to recount the rest of it. This wasn't because she wanted to finish her story, though. It was more so because her foot had been crushed from the impact with Garfield's face. She's buying time. While this did render her somewhat immobile, the sight of his resilience had also left her with a feeling of ecstasy. Yeah? Ecstasy, huh? What, you, what else you feeling? Eventually leading to their final exchange of words right at the climax of their battle. Yeah, they're climaxing now, all right. What Elsa said to Garfield wasn't this line that we saw in the anime. It was instead something more along the lines of this. A much more endearing statement that highlights the root cause for her affection. It is because that you will kill me, that you are- So okay, so in, in, in the anime, right? The, the dialogue? Affection. In the anime, the, uh, the dialogue of- what was it? Come on. Come on. My love for you will be begin after I kill you. I thought this is like, kind of like, aligning with her interest of- Bowel hunter, and after I kill you and I sp and you spread your bowels open, then I will fall in love with you more. I thought of something like that. But based on anything, the cut content is actually she's already admitted her death. She's like, you know what? This is my time. It is because that you will kill me that you are my first love. So it sounds like Elsa at the end of the day, she just wanted to die. This is like her final mission. And she's, she's like, this is it. I'm good with it. Much more endearing statement that highlights the root cause for her affection. You see, Elsa knew Garfield was going to be the one to kill her. Huh. He had proved numerous times over that he was more than capable of it. So, it was because of that very commitment. Was Elsa some sort of like a quote-unquote immortal freak that wanted to experience death, true death? Like she could never die? So she's like, finally, I want to know what defeat is like. Is that, is that what that is? Meant to do so that she was able to love him unlike she'd loved anyone else before. That didn't mean she was resigning herself to death, but it did showcase her understanding of the outcome of this battle. With the rest of it being pretty much the same. That's crazy, bro. This is how my girl goes down? Just literally squashed by a hippo? Come on! And I think another thing that wasn't stated because it's not cut content is Elsa. Like, there's a lot of times Elsa prioritized Matey. 
over the fight with Garfield, and Elsa kind of suffered for it. Kind of shield like, yeah, Elsa is a heinous villain. Of course, she's the battle hunter, right? She's an assassin. But with her backstory, you can kind of understand how she turned out like this. And there's like this soft side for Mady that like, I did appreciate she wasn't just this heartless monster. She cared about Maylee. It being pretty much the same. There's only one last thing that we need to talk about. And that's the way that Elsa had been caught off guard by Garfield. Maybe. Considering what we saw in the anime. I'm sure you found this to be a bit out of character for her. Out of character, but at the same... Well... We didn't really know about Maidie until recently and how she's working with Elsa. And the break times, we've seen how they were pretty much sisters, right? And Elsa also confirmed that me and her were sisters. When Garfield and, you know, Frederica showed them they're like siblings. So I think that it's like a beautiful thing to show before her inevitable death. I mean, someone as skilled as herself wouldn't be so sidetracked as to simply let Garfield approach without any consequence. Liabilities, man. It's not man. like she willingly let this happen, but the way it was portrayed in the novels made it seem like she didn't have a choice. You see, Melee getting caught up in the rubble forced Elsa to abandon everything she was doing to go and save her. She had jumped straight towards the falling debris and started Aww. slashing it to pieces. But even her godlike speed wasn't enough to keep up with the amount of rubble that was falling. So, it was as Elsa was occupied with that that Garfield saw an opportunity to close the gap on her, leaving Elsa with zero time to counter or even dodge. That's how Garfield ended up getting the jump on her. With that being it for the events at the mansion, we can now switch over to the All last right. parts of Amelia's trials. And I'm glad that one of the final things that pretty much signed her death was the bite onto her nape, like how Mady confirmed in the break time, remember? The foreshadowing in break time, that's crazy. There's probably even more Easter eggs and foreshadowing and break times that I've missed too, but it is just nice to see that like be tied into the story. It was in this realm of nothingness that the only thing present was Amelia's consciousness. Neither her body nor any of her five senses remained anymore. The only thing left was what we would probably consider to be her soul. As Amelia tried to make sense of what this place was, numerous mysterious lights started to appear from the darkness. Amelia couldn't exactly reach out to it because of her missing body, but she could feel her consciousness moving itself closer to it. It was almost as if she was being compelled to go to it. When her consciousness finally overlapped with one, that's when she was exposed to the first vision of the future she was bound to face. The Blame anime's smoke. version of it cut itself off a little bit early, but what Amelia saw in the novel was herself talking about a nightmare that she knew was coming, something she'd always thought about before but constantly kept denying. Now that this calamity was finally here though, the Amelia of this vision could only smile towards what's described to be the person she hated the most. Smile. Finally ending with a single tear all while she proclaimed how they never should have met before. Probably Subaru. In this timeline, Amelia hates Subaru the most. The vision after this brings us to a despair-filled scene involving Subaru and Reinhardt. And then it was like, you can only be a hero, that's all you'll ever be. That's what Puck kind of said to Reinhardt too. As both were standing on opposite cliffs that overlooked a forest. Damn! Subaru spoke about some kid who was supposed to be their enemy. It's just like you said, that kid's our enemy and our wound runs deep. What? Our enemy? What kid? He then followed it up with a peculiar line regarding how he might not be able to save Reinhardt. Which makes you wonder how exactly Subaru was going to do that. What? I can't use Heal Imagine, so even if we back out now, I might not be able to save you. What the hell? They're working together at this point with Reinhardt and Subaru. That kid is our enemy. Just like you said, that kid's our enemy. Who knows what kid it is? Maybe a complete kid. Maybe it's a kid that we've... Maybe it's Felt! <laughs> Felt is the monster! No, I don't know. In any case, both seemed rather torn on what they were supposed to do. But it was Subaru who was most upset with Reinhardt for having saved him. When Reinhardt extended... Subaru is mad that Reinhardt saved him. And it his hand to assist Subaru from the cliff that was opposite him. Subaru just kept his back turned and said what we saw in the anime. Ending the second future that was sure to be brought from Amelia's choices. Damn, that's pretty sad. Something about this timeline, shit just goes wrong. There's a kid, who knows what kid it is. And it's the enemy, and we don't know what to do. And he's, this kid is like the disaster of everything. Amelia also mentioned, you know, perhaps it's true that we should have never met. Who knows who that person is? I, I want to say it's still Subaru, but this is one of those if routes. Who knows? Ending the second future that was sure to be brought from Amelia's choices. Now, with more and more lights appearing before her, 
Amelia resolved herself to face each and every single one of them. Petra, I'm she down. would bear witness to every calamity that awaited her. While the anime made it seem like all of them were happening at once, what she was actually experiencing was individual visions just like the first two. Okay. Each showing a tragedy completely different from the last. But the way they were shown in the novels was only through the one-liners like how we saw in the anime. If you're wondering which character said what, well, Wilhelm's voice was the one right after Subaru's. Oh, that then was Wilhelm. following that was none other than Petra. That was Petra. Subaru and Emilia both tired. Sorry, and yet I've become a burden on you. I've always wanted to say that I'm sorry for never measuring up. Without that, have you not even a sword to swing, you damn thief? Is this directed towards us? I don't know. Yes, her voice was a lot more mature, but that was in fact Petra who was talking there. Huh. It was after this that Rom was the one talking about his granddaughter. Felt. Felt. Then Al was the one apologizing for not being able to kill someone. Oh, that was this Al! This was then followed up with an additional line of him saying how he was going to keep that person to himself for all eternity. I'll keep you to myself for all eternity. I'm sorry, I'm so... It's, it's just so hard to theorize what the hell is happening because this is like the end game of different timelines where shit went wrong and there's no way to just like... I can try to backtrack, but... I can't even right now because these are all different timelines. ...for not being able to kill someone. This was then followed up with an additional line of him saying how he was going to keep that person to himself for all eternity. The only person I know is close to, you know, Al is fucking Priscilla, but... Oh no. As for the next one, I'm sure you could tell that it was Otto talking about being left in the cave. Yeah. Then immediately after... Yeah, it sounds like there's a lot of regrets of like, damn, there was, it sounds like he's like turning against Subaru. What, you feel like this is fulfilling your promise? If so, then you should have left me die wrapped in a mat in that cave. If you're going to show me a dawn like this, it should have all ended there. Like, Otto sounds like he never wanted to be saved and it's better that he died there rather than seeing whatever future has happened with Subaru. After was Cruz shouting about how- The curse, right? Cruz and the curse is very interesting. This, we'll, we'll remember this, like- who knows if she got cursed later down in a different timeline, or maybe she already has the curse and she's keeping she it a secret, right? Like, so let's let's keep that very important in mind. Kirush may have some sort of curse. To die to a curse. Priscilla was the voice talking about winning. Yeah, it sounded like Priscilla actually won in that timeline. So this is the good route for Priscilla. And Ram was the one speaking about the kind nature of the person she wanted to kill. Someone I want to kill this much. Don't be such a good, gentle person. What a nightmare. Who is that person you want to kill? I don't know! With Julius being the voice that refused to bend the knee. It okay. only makes sense that Anastasius was the one right after his. Am I really that greedy? Do I really ask so much? I just don't want to be alone. Yeah, that, that, the, the dialogue from Anastasia there, it felt very like, um... Like for the first time, it felt like she was vulnerable and very emotional. Well, something bad's happening. Ana Anastasia, I guess, loses in that run? I don't know. Both of which were then followed by Garfield. The rest of them were Roswell, Frederica, Felt, and Felix in that order. Something about the soul being not, you know, holding. Felt mentioned magic dragons. Fuck it. I'll like destroy it all. Felt the dragon slayer confirmed. Finally ending with Rem and Subaru in the last vision she had to go through. When Amelia awoke in Echidna's dream world after, there was something odd about the arrangement of the table in front of her. Hmm. Not only were there six vacant chairs currently present, but there was also an equal number of cups and treats laid out as well. Oh. Some of which were still half filled with tea. So all of this went to indicate that witches. up until recently the witches were having a tea party. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> then they left immediately when Amelia showed up. A kid that's so mean. Ew. The weird girl's showing up. Let's leave. But Minerva, Minerva sticks around because Minerva is most likely Amelia's mom at this point. Once Minerva had appeared behind Amelia. Her immense aura and intimidating presence had caused Amelia's entire body to go completely numb. It didn't take more than a second for her to understand that this was a being beyond her own comprehension. An existence she felt was powerful enough to completely annihilate every fiber of her being. She a witch. That much was easy to sense from the presence of such a dense layer of miasma. That said, this was the standard reaction for any normal person. Which is why Minerva ended up making a comment about Subaru. It really is that boy with the foul look on his eyes who's the strange one. The foul look. The mean eyes. Fortuna also has mean eyes like Subaru. She didn't exactly say his name, but she did mention how the boy with the foul look was the only strange one. Subaru. Likely in reference to how nonchalant he was when it came to dealing with the other witches. It was immediately after Minerva hinted at Subaru that Amelia's head perked up. She then proceeded to ask if he was the one she was talking about. A question that Minerva indirectly answered by saying this. 
whatever it was she was implying here. It's obvious that there's something much bigger going on involving Subaru and Amelia. You probably cut that's mar- I don't know that's mar- Is this like a sarcastic that's mar marvelous or is this a sincere one? Does Minerva approve of Subaru? I don't know. Something that only the witches seem to know about. But anyway, it was after this question that Minerva followed up with one of her own. She wanted to know how Amelia felt about Subaru. So Amelia went on to tell her all about how Subaru said she loved her. It was for that reason that she was able to see him as someone who was very precious. While Minerva seemed to dismiss this answer as if she didn't care, the way she spoke indicated otherwise. It was almost as if she seemed a little bit relieved or something. As the two continued to talk, Relieved that Subaru... It's like a mom relieved that... I don't know, is this like a... Like, like when Subaru first... Not first, but in the second witch tea party when like Minerva like calls Subaru out on this bullshit and calls him a hypocrite and she is also a hypocrite, Wonder how Subaru is to Minerva's perspective. Does, does she does she approve of the potential boyfriend of her daughter? And is this like a little sifting? Just being like, hey, how do you feel about that boy? Yeah, he's good to you? Okay. I don't know. Amelia slowly became more comfortable with the incomprehensible being standing behind her. But when she asked if she could talk face to face with it, she was met with a statement of denial that seemed to carry a lot of weight with it. You can't, if you do, my fist, which have let so many people die, which have let so many people die, will cry out. You're gonna fucking beat your daughter up? But I, hold up, hold up. I thought your fists are meant to heal people. But she's saying that her fists have let so many people die. Maybe she's counting the lives that she wasn't able to save as death due to her fists? There wasn't any hint of a lie when Minerva said that her fists had let many people die before. Maybe this is before Minerva became the Witch of Wrath and her fist indeed let people die, but afterwards she got the power to fucking heal by destroying? Yeah. So Amelia decided not to push the issue any further. Instead, they went on to talk about Echidna and the final trial. While Echidna did accept the results of Amelia's trials, she couldn't be bothered to follow through with the rest of it. So that's why Minerva was here instead. She was filling in for Echidna's position as the administrator. Now, if you're here for an explanation on why Minerva acted the way she did, mom. Well, unfortunately, the context we're given is about the same as it was in the She's novels. a mom! The only difference was the peculiar existence of Minerva's heartbeat despite her supposedly being dead. Heartbeat despite being dead? What? There was also a moment towards the end where her wrath was starting to come out. Though Amelia thought that she'd done something to make her mad, this was more so just Minerva acting the way she normally did. That said, there was something about these words she- That part of you is so like your mother! Or your father, what is it? Said in the way she said them that just seemed so very nostalgic to her. So, I'm sure they were meant to allude to whatever pre-existing relationship there was between them. It's gotta be mom. Or maybe grandmother. And if the timeline doesn't match up because she exists to pre-calamity and Amelia is supposed to be only quote-unquote 100 something years old, it's easy. Freeze this bitch before. You could say something like Minerva was scared that Sato was gonna go crazy so she decided to like somehow like... I don't know, freeze... Well, but then, then that's the other thing. Like Satala also was pretty old by then. But then I'm, I, it's it's weird. If you think that they're twin sisters, then it it gets weirder. But if they weren't, then you mean like a younger sister? I don't know. I, I still want to believe this is the mom though. There's a, there's a if not mom, at least related somehow. Grandma, there's something. Something's gotta be there. All her behaviors and all these different evidences lying up. It's it just seems too much like it. But a show like ReZero, isn't that too obvious then? Maybe we're getting baited. Maybe this is too simple and we're getting baited by Tape. Anyway, it's after this that we get to the part with Amelia releasing the barrier. But part of what was cut from here relates to stuff that will most likely be shown later. Okay. So I think here's a good spot to end the episode. Then once we come back next week, we'll pick things up again from the beginning of Ram's fight with Roswell. And that's the interesting thing because the next cut content I can't really watch until like episode 24 is covered. So like... The final two cut content will most likely be done in after we finish the finale. And then there is actually uh, even more cut content, I think, as well as a summary for everyone preparing into reason, uh, Reaser Season 3. But here's the video. Please go like Mr. Anonis' channel. Check it out if you haven't. And I'll see you next time.